Well, the stars blazed bright, showed brave men the way. And the guns by night is where they'd lay. With the land so old and harsh, much to be uncovered. These stories we will tell on Australia rediscovered. Come here about it all with Rico. On Australia rediscovered. G'day and welcome to episode 5 in this, the first season of Australia Rediscovered, the podcast. Now over the first four episodes we've looked at the life, the achievements of some epic explorers including Sturt, Leichhardt, Eyre and Stuart and this time around we're talking about a man who was killed with a stick by a bloke and a bunch of his mates standing around to back him up. I know what you're thinking but no it's not a Bankstown block party, it's the life and achievements of Edmund Kennedy, an unsung hero in Australian exploration. And of course, joining me once again, as he always does each fortnight, is my old mate Dingo Dave. Dave, how are you, buddy? Excellent, Rico. Excellent. That's the way, mate. Someone asked me this week, why is your name Dingo? Did your mother not like you or something? What's the go? (laughs) My mother loved me very much, mate. No, um, it was actually on a trip with you that I inherited that name. So uh, our cameraman extraordinaire, Sean, we, if you remember, we had two Daves on the trip, and two Daves on different UHFs was a little bit complicated. So I became Dingo because we were on Fraser, and that's one of my favourite places to be. And I guess the name just stuck. So here I am, Dingo Dave. Well, there you go. I have a sort of different recollection of how that all went down, but uh, but that's okay. <laughs> You can keep yours, I'll keep mine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, look, I'm sure that yours is far more family friendly. Fair enough. <laughs> All right, mate, so Edmund Besley Court Kennedy. How's that for a mouthful? Besley, I've never That's heard that as a second name. Or Court, C-O-U-R-T. There you go, Edmund yeah. Besley Court Kennedy. He was uh, obviously an explorer. He was born on the 5th of September in 1818 on Guernsey in the Channel Islands. And he was the sixth of eight children of the good Colonel Thomas Kennedy. So his old man was a colonel. There you go. And his wife, the, the colonel's wife, Mary Ann, who was the daughter... Uh, and I only mention this because it's interesting. He was the daughter of Thomas Smith, who was a one-time Lord Mayor of London. So Sir Old Mate Edmund comes from pretty good stock. He does. He was educated at Elizabeth College in Guernsey, and he was trained as a surveyor. He was driven by what his old man called an almost mad ambition to distinguish himself, much like my good self. He embarked for Australia, arriving in Sydney in 1840, and while he was only 21, he was appointed as a, an assistant surveyor in the Surveyor General's Department. Now... I don't know about you, but I'm starting to see a bit of a pattern developing here with all of these explorers of the, the early to mid-1800s and gigs in the Surveyor General's Department. I think surveying back then must have been a very... I think there would have been a lot less high-vis and high-luxes, mate. It seems to have been the place to be if you're... You know, if there's a bit of adventure in your blood, that's where you went looking because, you know, how much of the country had been mapped at that point, you know, a percent, two percent, that was the place to be. So, yeah, the Surveyor General's Department seemed to have been the nurseries, if you like, for all those people who had an interest in getting out there and exploring the country. Yeah, it's a really good way to put it, isn't it? A nursery of explorers. Yeah, and it's, Jesus, churned out some rippers. Now, he began his duty on the 7th of August in 1840 and immediately left under a bloke named Charles Tyres for the Portland Bay Settlement in Western Victoria. In 1841, he began general survey work, and there he earned a fair bit of praise, but in 1842, he got himself into a bit of trouble. He had an altercation with a local magistrate. Now, there's a bloke you don't want to have dramas with, this is the, the local lawmaker, gee whiz. It was all over nothing more than a, a really trivial matter, and although Kennedy's motive was to protest against an injustice, it turned out to be fruitless, and it showed a little bit of poor judgment and... I guess you could say youthful exuberance on his part. You know, he's he's standing up for the right thing, but it hasn't done him any favours because he's picked a fight with the wrong bloke. But the worst part of it is it left him further open to more, I guess, adverse reports. Uh, and this was the result of an indiscreet dalliance with an immigrant Irish girl, Margaret Murphy, by whom he <laughs> actually had a daughter. So, uh, you know, back in those days, it was still pretty much frowned upon to go around fathering children and not be married. It was a very bad social thing to do. Now, this bloke Blair, the magistrate, his main allegations were found by the superintendent Charles Latrobe, now there's a name, not to be borne out by the facts. In other words, Blair's probably just exaggerated a little bit and, you know, used his 
position as the magistrate to uh, to try and use his influence to get him into more trouble than he should have been. So Charles Latrobe said, no, nah, look, that's enough, fellas. We'll call it there. But regardless, Kennedy was recalled to Sydney and he wrote to the governor, a manly defence of his action, they said. <laughs> and he, most importantly, he expressed deep contrition for his dalliance with the girl. Now, Charles Latrobe, there's a name a lot of Victorians will know. Yeah, so what do we have? We've got uh, La Trobe University, obviously, and that's, that's a very, very big um, uni with a lot of out programs too, interestingly enough. It, it is one of those unis that is sort of um, big in their earth science uh, and, and fields like that. Um, now, being Melbourne, there'd have to be a coffee shop named after him, wouldn't there? Would that be right? <laughs> uh, there was, he also went on to be the governor, and he was a governor at a really robust time in Victoria's history. It was right around the time of gold being discovered and the real gold rushes had started. And and he was actually responsible for invoking the miners having to buy a licence. And that's what, of course, led to the Eureka Stockade. So there you go, Charles Latrobe. Interesting fella. He actually quit and went back to England because it all got too much. So there you go. Oh, did he really? Yeah. So after... Um, Kennedy's return to Sydney on the 12th of July in 1843, his duties were not really a whole lot because of the falling off in land sales, most of the surveyors were on half pay and Kennedy practically had nothing to do for around a couple of years. That would drive you nuts. He did, however, establish himself as a popular and charming member of society with a rowdy, boyish sense of fun, much like my good self. Popular and charming member of society indeed. His gifts included a pleasant... (laughs) Sorry? (laughs) We were talking about having different versions of stories. Yeah, there you go. (laughs) His gifts included a pleasant singing voice, again, much like my good self, and considerable skill in sketching in pencil and watercolour. That's traits I don't have, unfortunately. There you go. It sounds like he would have been a good bloke to go camping with anyway. Yeah, indeed. It's, you know, love the bush. He was clearly a knock-around kind of guy that was happy to uh, get in and get his hands dirty. You know, all he needed was a bit of um, didgeridoo practice there, mate, and he, he would have been the uh, he would have been the real deal. <laughs> there you go. You, you can't didgeridoo and sing at the same time, though. <laughs> this is true. There's a bit of an inside joke there, but <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd like to see someone didgeridoo and sing at the same time. That could be interesting. Inactivity was hard for Kennedy to take. He just he couldn't handle it. But he did find an outlet in November 1845 when he was suddenly and unexpectedly appointed the second in command under the infamous Sir Thomas Mitchell of an expedition to find an overland route to the Gulf of Carpentaria. Now, under this infamous leader, Kennedy was kept somewhat in the background. And after minor initial criticisms, which is not to be unexpected when you're working for Mitchell, Mitchell praised his temperate and gentlemanly way and highly honourable principles, as he put it with frequent references to his zeal and his activity. So he's obviously, like we said earlier, an energetic bloke. Kennedy had a very difficult assignment, and he performed this to Mitchell's really high standards of maintaining a base camp for over four months while Mitchell probed the centre of west of Queensland, uh, and he discovered some excellent country out there in a river which he named the Victoria. Now, once the job was done, they returned to Sydney in January of 1847. Now, Sir Thomas Mitchell, he had quite the reputation as a hard man to work with or even just get along with. Yeah, and for this young man, I mean, you know, our, our mate Kennedy here was only 27, 28 years old to have then been put in charge of those supply camps. I mean, that's, that's a crucial role. You know, if you're, if you're Mitchell and heading off with your small group to push further forward, you have to rely on the fact that that supply camp is still there and still in good condition and still being taken care of and your supplies are still available. So it certainly wasn't like he was being left behind. It was very much like he was being left in charge. And that was a massive, massive um, set of responsibilities on a young bloke who really, this was his, his first month before or into the bush. Yeah, it was. Well, this this particular expedition that they went on as well, it wasn't wasn't the typical small Mitchell expedition. This was one where he got loaded with a whole bunch of other stuff that he wasn't really interested in. And it ended up being a train of something like 30-odd horses and 30 men. And so looking after the camp for that, something that big, like you said, it's a pretty huge deal. So Mitchell, obviously, he was impressed with the leadership qualities of Kennedy. Obviously, it was, this was demonstrated by his management of these depot camps in 1846, and his technical skills also relating to survey and exploration, which was what he was trained in. Now, as the question of a great northwest river remained unanswered, Mitchell gained approval in February 1847 for a new expedition to the Gulf with the express purpose of plotting the course of his Victoria River. He wanted to find out where it actually went. Did it actually go to the Gulf like he thought it did? 
So this time we placed Kennedy in charge of a party of eight. They set off from Windsor in New South Wales on the 21st of March in 1847. Now I find that really interesting because all of my family on my father's side all lived in Windsor. And I reckon that a bloke named Michael O'Brien who came over from Ireland in 1836 might have even been there to see him off. And that would have been pretty cool. That is very cool, mate. That's, uh, that's history in the making. My grandmother, and when she was a baby, was once helped across a flooded river by the Kelly Gang. Oh, there really? You there you my, go. Yeah, yeah. She's, it's actually in her, before she passed, she did actually um, have the opportunity to record her memoirs. Yeah, a few years before she left. And, and that was sort of the one of those amazing things that she recounted. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, I find that family tree stuff absolutely fascinating. And search as hard as I might, I've not been able to go back any further than, than this bloke, Michael O'Brien, who came over in 1836. Once I get back to the Irish stuff, I can't find a damn thing. It's uh, wow. it's it's way way beyond my means, unfortunately. Uh, my big sister is right into it, mate. That's that's her bread and butter. Oh, really? Oh, maybe we should talk. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. So uh, Kennedy had instructions, and they were to travel by the St George Bridge to the Maranoa River, where his earlier depot had already been, and then determine the course of this Victoria River that that Mitchell had named. Kennedy had spent some time plotting Mitchell's Victoria River on the latest map of the colony. And he was struck by the fact that its general course turned towards a bend of Cooper Creek, which we know is, was named by Charles Sturt in 1845. If you haven't listened to the Charles Sturt podcast, which was our first one in this season, go check that out. The expedition con- continued northward. And now this was new territory for Kennedy. He hadn't been here before, so he's, he's striking up some new ground. And by mid-August of 1847, he was in the vicinity from which Mitchell had been forced to return. Kennedy decided to conceal the carts and the supplies from the local Aborigines by digging a large trench in which to bury them and then proceed with pack horses. Now, who just goes, what on earth, I'll just bury this great big thing in a great big trench in the middle of nowhere. That's just, it's unbelievable. But what I love seeing is the way that things are unfolding here, you know, as, as the next explorer carries on from where the others left off. So, you know, Sturt's gone up there and then... Kennedy, oh, sorry, Mitch was gone up there, and then Kennedy's picked up from where he's left off. I think that's great. Mm, yeah, very much so. And and sort of the how often do we keep linking back to Cooper Creek? You know, how often do we do we find just how significant significant a find that was? Um, and that's still going to come up in a number of, a number of more stories, isn't it? That the these same these people were in that same vicinity, learning what someone else had learned, being able to find in many cases the actual campsite that they that another explorer had used. And yeah, yeah there's no GPS involved in this. This is just excellent, excellent diary taking. It's amazing to me. It really is. Like we're talking a tree, one tree in the middle of the continent. Yeah. You know? That's just unfathomable to me. I, I cannot understand how they did it. I'd love to learn that navigation stuff. So this river that he's now scouting, it, it begins to turn towards the southwest, taking them away from the Gulf. And scouting ahead, he found a substantial tributary joining the Victoria from the north, and he named it the Thompson River, in honour of the Colonial Secretary, Mr Edward Dias Thompson. The country began to dry out, and by early September, Kennedy was forced to retreat to his hidden cache because of lack of water and supplies. It's always the go out there, isn't it? The river by this time had showed no sign of turning towards the Gulf, but it looked as though it would run into the Cooper. Kennedy's plan altered, then to split the party and make a dash for the Gulf. When a berry cart was opened at the depot, it was found to have been tampered with by the natives, and a lot of the supplies had been taken or destroyed. So this left the expedition with no alternative but to head for home back to Sydney. On the homeward journey, Kennedy he kept busy. He followed the course of the Warrego River, which had been discovered by Mitchell in 1846, until its course took him too far west. So he decided to go east, and he intercepted the Colgoa River, which is located roughly between Burke and Lightning Ridge in northern New South Wales, and he returned to Sydney in February 1848. It was later proved that the Victoria did flow into the Cooper, and thus it was renamed the Baku River, an Aboriginal name that Kennedy had learnt along the way. I find it interesting the way that they name things when they go out on these trips. Now, if you were to name a landmark of any great importance, you discovered it, who would you name it after and why, Dingo? That's a tough one, mate. Like these guys are for many, many of our explorers we're talking about have been naming it after the people who made it possible. You know, so we've got you know, or, or the queen or the king or, or whoever. You know, they're they're naming it after a person who was of great importance to them. So I I really struggle when he threw this question at me earlier today. I'm like, I mean, well, firstly, what's left to discover? <laughs> I guess <laughs> part of it. Um, 
I don't know. I, I guess you know, with with who I am and what my and what I do, I would have to consider what the traditional owners of that area had called it or had had acknowledged that that area was famous for. You know, there may well be an aspect in there that they hadn't actually named themselves or, or hadn't actually frequented. But I'd like to think that there was some some way to 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 speak to the elders or to speak to the TOs and actually um, say valued in that location and then maybe use that value as a way, I think, to, to name that landmark. I'm not sure. That was a really tough one for me. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't name it after a politician and you wouldn't have the Pauline Hanson Rangers or something? No, no. <laughs> let's move it on. <laughs> All right. So he'd, uh, he'd basically gotten this expedition – under his belt now, so this is the first one that he didn't let him. He'd led himself, even though Mitchell had appointed him, and it was essentially it was still Mitchell's expedition. The government they had plans for another journey, and this was going to be one that Kennedy would would actually lead himself. And this was primarily to find a way to the Gulf, and then follow that up with some exploration of Cape York Peninsula itself. Now, the importance of Port Essington, which was the only port in northern Australia at the time, and we've spoken about Port Essington before when we talked about Dr Ludwig Leichhardt, who went from the Darling Down to Port Essington, which is sort of east of Darwin. The importance of that port had declined, but trade along the east coast between Sydney and Singapore had started to increase, which prompted a bloke by the name of Owen Stanley, and he was the captain of a ship called the HMS Rattlesnake. He said that, let's go check out the east coast of Cape York, let's explore that area first. And he further suggested that after a resupply of the party at the tip of the Cape, a place we've both been, the exploration could continue down the west coast with a subsequent return overland to Sydney. What a massive journey that would be. It was anticipated... Have these people not heard of... Have they not heard of crocodiles? Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. I know, it's Get just crazy. <laughs> it's anticipated that... 18 months would be required to complete this trip. That's a, that's a long time to be away. The idea was accepted, which, again, blows my mind. You, you're taking these crazy harebrained screams to the government. They're going, yeah, no worries, mate. Here's your coin. Off you go. Try doing that today. And planning began for Kennedy to head to a starting point at Rockingham Bay near the present town of Cardwell in Queensland. So for those keeping count, this is Kennedy's third expedition and the second that he commanded. Now, I'm starting to wonder at this point what his old mate Sir Thomas Mitchell is thinking now that Kennedy is leading his own bona fide expedition. Yeah, is he is he proud of the boy? Like, you know, were, were they still, you know, in between their trips, were they still sort of um, Mates. communicating with each yeah. other? Were they still sharing ideas? Like, were they, did Thomas Mitchell feel that maybe he, he'd sort of been usurped and the young bloke had sort of taken uh, a task that he wanted to do? Or was Mitchell off? On some equally important um, adventure somewhere else in Australia, it would just be just be so much fun to know. And I reckon when we get around to having a chat about Mitchell, um, we might fill in some of those gaps. Well, it's interesting because Sir Thomas Mitchell has such a reputation for you know really not liking other people stepping on his toes and and stealing his thunder, so to speak. So that's what makes me wonder. Now that Kennedy's got his own expedition and Thomas Mitchell has been bypassed. You know, how does he feel about this? You know, I guess we'll never know. Now, on the 28th of April in 1848, Edmund Kennedy and 12 men sailed from Sydney Harbour in the bark Tam O'Shanter. A bark is a boat, by the way, in case you're wondering. Uh, and it was escorted by the aforementioned HMS Rattlesnake. They arrived at Rockingham Bay in May, and once they'd landed, the party encountered terrible terrain, such as mangrove swamps, mountains, lagoons, rivers, and thick rainforests. It made it almost impossible to travel with horses, carts and sheep. And after nine weeks of slogging it out, they travelled only 40 miles from the coast and 12 miles north of the landing point. Now, Kennedy had to abandon the carts and some supplies in a hopeless bog. And anyone who spent any time up in that region will totally understand. This is where the rainforest meets the beach. It doesn't get much rougher than this. The party was due to rendezvous at Prince Charlotte Bay with the supply ship Bramble in August, but this didn't happen because the party was firstly two months late. In any case, there was nowhere for the Bramble to land anyway. So so things were really starting to unravel a bit for Kennedy now. I mean, we, we look at that area now and, you know, we have the luxury of being able to cruise up the Bruce Highway and see the steep ranges of the Great Divide to, to our left if we're heading north. Uh, and then obviously the ocean to our right and, and sort of not a lot in between. There wasn't a lot of landing ground. There's, there's not a lot of sort of... Um, place to make your way so for the fact that 
that Kennedy's team had to turn south for 40 miles before they were able to start going north again. That must have been a tough or a bitter, bitter pill to swallow for all those guys in that in that crew. And the fact that they're trying to push through that kind of country with that with that caravan, you know, with the, the horse and the sheep and the carts, where basically you would be just stepping left, stepping right around trees to get through that kind of denseness of scrub. Absolutely amazing. But, yeah, who, who surveyed the starting point? Um, I guess, you know, that was part of the point to find out what was up there. But, yeah, massive task. Yeah, but surely when you look at it from, from the ocean side, it's still going to look like it's fairly impassable. Like we've been up in that area. We know what it's like, especially where you've got all the mangroves and stuff like that. You, yeah, I don't know. It beggars belief, doesn't it? It really does. Like, I, yeah, and, and, of course, we do know that there were better landing points available further north. So why was that area chosen? Was it to try and open up um, some of that country around the inside of Hinchinbrook, perhaps? Who knows? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, look, it's little wonder that they were two months late, and I'm surprised that it was only two months late given what they had to deal with, and like you said, that caravan that they'd taken through. But by mid-November, the men and the horses all began to weaken, understandably so. You know, it's really hot and humid up there as well, you know, most of the year round. So the decision was taken to leave eight men behind at Weymouth Bay while Kennedy and four others continued north. Now, there were still several hundred k's to go to a rendezvous point with the ship Ariel before any hope of rescue might have been possible. Days after crossing the Pasco River, when in the vicinity of Shelburne Bay, Costigan accidentally shot himself, this is one of the blokes in the party, accidentally shot himself, as you do, while tending his horse, and he couldn't continue. So two other blokes, Luff and Dunn, were left behind to care for him. Now, they were never seen again. Kennedy and his Aboriginal tracker, a bloke by the name of Jackie Jackie, pressed on towards Port Albany and the rendezvous, but they were closely followed by local Indigenous people. Now, near the banks of the Escape River, 20 miles from the tip of Cape York, Kennedy was speared several times and he died in Jackie Jackie's arms and he was just 31 years of age. What a miserable way to die. Absolutely, in such a remote, remote location. And particularly, yeah, there would have to have been going through your mind at that time that you were actually, you know, Jackie Jackie and Edmund were the last hope for the men that had to leave behind. You know, if they couldn't make it to the to the ship, then those eight men who were, were waiting at various locations behind them had no chance at all. So the desperation that must have been there and then to have finally, you know, realise that that was it, he was for it, must have just been, oh, I just can't imagine it. How must have Jackie Jackie felt seeing his people having done this to his mate? But he still stayed with yeah. him. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Like his, like Jackie Jackie has been, you know, I guess remembered, you know, it, 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 when he's remembered fairly, he is actually remembered as a man of, of massive integrity and determination um, yep. to have taken this task on, took on this job, and to ha- absolutely done whatever was necessary to see it through to the end. So when, when treated fairly by history, Jackie Jackie really does it come across as the hero of this story. Yep. Now, from the existing reports, it seems that Kennedy's death resulted from attacks that don't seem to have been directly provoked. Now, of course, they're only ever going to tell one side of the story. We understand that. Despite that, after a feat of endurance of about 10 days with no supplies, Jackie Jackie, the hero, he made it to the supply ship loan on the 23rd of December in 1848. And following directions from Jackie Jackie, the Ariel proceeded to Shelburne Bay and then sent a search party ashore. Now, a few relics were found, but there were no sign of the three men. The ship continued to Weymouth Bay, where William Caron and William Goddard were found to be the the only survivors of the eight men left there. The Ariel, with its three surviving expeditioners, returned to Sydney in May of 1849. There you go. That's a pretty sad story and a pretty sad ending for a bloke who... He did it tough, let's be honest. You know, he's he's up there in the Cape. There's, There's... not much more difficult country in Australia than the Cape. You know, it doesn't matter what time of the year it is, but when you're up there in, you know, February, April, May, tell you what, mm. seriously tough going. Absolutely. And, you know, had I, I can't help but think that had he made it that extra 20 k's and made it to the boat and made it back to Sydney, where else would this bloke have gone? You yeah, know, that's by right. By the age of 31, he had done so much and made a name for himself and, and honestly had probably, you know, it, it's probably fair to say that in some of his, particularly this last trip, he faced maybe greater diversity, uh, adversity than others did. You know, where could he have found next? You know, where, yeah. may, what, what other discoveries may have gone down to this man? Oh, we'll never know. Well, it obviously never happened. Now, like all of the great explorers, Kennedy has had several places named after him and several monuments erected. 
There's the former electoral district. There's always an electoral district of Kennedy there is. in uh, in the Queensland Legis- Legislative Assembly and the division of Kennedy in the Parliament of Australia, named after him. There's the Edmund Kennedy National Park, which was established in 1977. Kennedy Highway, Kennedy, a Queensland locality in, as you mentioned earlier, the Cassowary Coast region, those nasty big birds that want to kill you to death. In 1852, a marble memorial to Kennedy was erected in St James Church in Sydney, and it depicts Kennedy dying in Jackie Jackie's arms. There's quite a few explorers' memorials in the St James Church in Sydney. I'm going to have to go and check that out. Uh, the centenary of the expedition was commemorated in 1948. So in May 1948, a monument to Kennedy was erected in Cardwell. In September in 1948, a monument to Kennedy was erected in Cooktown. In November 1948, a monument to Kennedy was erected at Portland Road in, in Weymouth Bay in the Iron Range in Queensland, near a spring where the expedition drew water from. That's a nice little touch. And the Kennedy Memorial Monument was unveiled on the 13th of December 1948 in Somerset, Queensland, in commemoration of the 100th anniversary of Kennedy's unsuccessful exploration of Cape York. I wouldn't call it unsuccessful. He still opened up some country, I think. Now, the monument comprises of a concrete slab on a concrete footing with a bronze commemorative plaque on its eastern face. In addition, bronze plaques were also placed in Charleville, Kennedy, Tully, and at the Escape River. How about that? Now, we have a photo of that that concrete slab with the um, the plaque on it, Rico. We do? So the bronze plaque. Yep, yep. When we when we were up there a couple of years ago, we did actually uh, do a run along that side of the Cape and we actually stopped and we found it and we took some photos of it and I went searching for them this afternoon and I could not find them. So they're sitting on a hard drive, uh, sitting on a hard yeah. drive somewhere. Would love to about to put those in the show notes. But, um, yeah, never mind. Anyway, we were we were there. All right, we're going to have a quick break, and after the break, Dingo Dave's going to come back, and he's going to share his top three places that you can visit yourself in your own four-wheel drive to get a real feel for the sort of country that Kennedy explored and spent so much of his time in. How was your day, sweetie? Terrible. A deal that I've been working on for weeks fell apart and... Yep. (sighs) Sounds like the time the gearbox went in my patrol. How is that the same, Terry? If you really love cars, Auto Auto One. All right, and we are back. Dingo Dave is now going to share with us his top three places that you can visit to get a real feel for the sort of country that Kennedy explored. Now, normally we would have a special guest here, and we'd have someone lined up from Brownwell Station up there on the Cape, but unfortunately things change and they couldn't make it. So Dingo is going to fill in this week, mate. Where can we go? a very busy day. I can can imagine, yeah. Yes, with all the rules changing and... A whole, deal, a whole lot of uncertainty about what those rules meant today, but then the final statement came out at 10 past four that meant said that Queenslanders can travel through Cookshire. That doesn't mean you can get to the tip. That, that's an important point because, of course, that's the NTA once we get across the Chardine. Uh, so, yeah, they've had a big day at Bramwell today. So hopefully we'll catch up with them at some time. So where can we go? Look, you can't talk about this without discussing the Cassowary Coast, as we did, and Cardwell. Cardwell, Rico, is probably one of my top four or five favourite seaside locations of anywhere I've ever been. I love that little town. If you haven't visited Cardwell, rather than just seeing it as a fuel stop, get out of your car, have a walk around. There's some really, really awesome stuff in Cardwell. And there is at the back of Cardwell, I tried to find the name of this road, I couldn't find it, but there is this crazy, it's sealed sort of, um, this crazy hill that comes down out of the mountain range behind it. So drove that a few years back, and that was a pretty full-on drive. Um, we came down. I, I, I can't imagine what it would have been like to have been churning up it for about an hour, but um, great, great place. So just south of Cardwell, there's a lookout, which um, you can see Hinchinbrook Island, obviously, which, of course, is a, another magnificent um, location on its own. But if you actually look north from the lookout, you can see just about all of the Kennedy National Park, and you can actually see the location that they landed. You can't really get yourself to that landing point for all the reasons we mentioned before, uh, how thick it was and how inhospitable it was. But you can get yourself up high at that lookout, look north, and you'll be able to see the bay in which they landed, which is pretty, pretty awesome. Yeah, that's that's a, a stunning location. My, um, when I was without calling it a number two, um, another amazing location, of course, is Somerset Lookout at Cape York. Now, Kennedy didn't make it there himself, but Jackie Jackie did. So Port Albany is where Jackie Jackie met um, the rescue ship or the resupply ship. Now, that Somerset Lookout is where you go to begin, if you like, the five beaches run at Cape York. So if you've ever... 
done the five beaches, and you absolutely should. It's a, it's a great way to spend an afternoon if you've made it all the way to Cape York. Up on that lookout before you drop down into the first beach, that's Somerset Lookout, and if you look across, that's actually Port Albany there. So that is where Jackie Jackie was described as running towards. So it was, a, it was described as a, a native man in, in shorts and uh, sorry in pants and shirt running towards the boat more dead than alive. That was the little <laughs> quote that I found from the people on the boat. And that's where he did it. So you can look down into that beach uh, where he was able to signal the ship, which is pretty, pretty cool, I think. And lastly, the Maranoa region. So here we just have that, that's such a massive, massive river system in there with the Maranoa that runs into Cooper's Creek. Um, and obviously the Baku is another part of that system. We just have so many incredible locations out in Western Queensland that all feed off these river systems. You know, there was the description earlier of the rivers sort of just turning into a series of channels. Well, today we call that the channel country, don't we? There is so much land, so much to explore. You know, you and I are going to be out there in a couple of weeks um, as I make my way back north through Queensland. Um, I'll be going through Sargo. I'll be going through a few other places, which are, of course, so heavily associated with all of that exploration through that channel country um, back 150 years ago. So, there we go, the Kennedy National Park. We've got then the Somerset Lookout looking down to where Jackie Jackie found the boat and then just the wide expanse of all these places that were opened up by these explorers who were exploring the Maranoa and then all that link into Cooper's Creek. Oh, there you go. There's a few cracking spots to add to your must-do list when you're heading up through Queensland and in, in particular up to the Cape. Somerset's really cool, actually. There's, uh, there's the grave there as well of a bloke called Frank Jardine, of course, the Jardine River, named after the Jardine family, so... Plenty to see there. Now, before we go, I wanted to quickly talk about our Australia Rediscovered Tag Along Tour. So, our, we just got news today, our Epic Coughs to the Border trip for August is now sold out, which is amazing. But there are a few spots left on our Outback New South Wales tour, and we're going to visit some of the places that was made famous by Charles Sturt. So, if you're, if you're enjoying the podcast and you're into your history, this is a tour that you are not going to want to miss. Now, if you'd like to know more, Head to rico.com.au, but don't muck around. There are only a handful of spots, not even a handful of spots left now. I think I've got three spots left. It's going to be an absolute corker, mate. Kicks off on July the 20th of this month, Dingo. I cannot wait, mate. I am looking, if I had to pick one spot I'm looking forward to the most here, it's Milparinka. I really, really enjoyed our quick visit there a couple of years ago. I'm absolutely looking forward to being able to spend a little bit more time in Milparinka and obviously Milparinka leads you into Tibaburra and then Cameron's Corner is, sorry, Cameron Corner is literally just around the corner from there. So that top end corner country is going to be very, very special. It is also going to be very, very cold. <laughs> so I hope you're preparing for that, my mate. I just picked up my new Darchi minus 12 sleeping bag. And, yes, the, uh, the cold there. mountain sleeping bag. I've got one of those myself. It's a cracker. Oh, and uh, once you're inside that dirty D swag, mate, you'll be, you'll be as right as rain. Not a problem I at all. Shall. Now, what am I looking forward to out there? Uh, I'll tell you what, all of it. It's a long list. Poking along the Darling River, you know, the south end be below Will Cantia and then the north end of it as well. There's some great pubs along the way. We're going to go to White Cliffs and, and check out some opal mining there and, and who knows, maybe strike at Rich and retire. Uh, and then, of course, the further up north we go, we're going to end up it's Sturt National Park. I love it up there in the jump ups. It's just oh, it's magnificent, fantastic country. And every night you're going to be treated to one of the best sunsets you will ever see anywhere in the outback. Let me tell you, you haven't lived until you've experienced an outback New South Wales sunset, I reckon. This is true. This is true. All right, folks. Well, thank you for tuning in. And as always, you can check out Dingo Dave's socials at uh, Dingo Dave 4x4 on Instagram and Dingo Dave on Facebook and obviously the Australian Off-Road Academy, which is where I actually do my real stuff. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you can check out me, Rico, at the Rico page. Just search for Rico 4x4 and take a look and like the Australia Rediscovered with Rico page while you're there. And don't forget, you can join us on one of our tag-along tours. Just head to rico.com.au. Thanks, folks, and we will catch you next fortnight. <laughs>